much, everyone, uh, for coming, uh, both those of you in the room here and those of you online uh, who are watching. We're doing a live stream of this lecture as we did last year, which seemed to be pretty popular. I got a lot of email requests for the link again, so I think uh, for all of our friends out there in cyberspace, welcome and thank you for attending this. As the slide says, this is the 20th annual Guantanamo Memorial Lecture. Some of us who knew Michael well find that very hard to believe that it's actually been 20 years. But on the other hand, that's a real testament to the legacy of his work and for this continuing lecture series, which frankly is, again, still only growing with time. Um, I will point out that uh, we actually have the first Guantanamo Lecture here in the audience, Professor Mandela over there, and we have uh, Professor Knipp, who I will introduce in a moment, so we even have bookended uh, the particular lecture series. Uh, this is Michael, and we always point out his trademark red sweater there on the right-hand side, which was the way you could always find him at Cedar meetings or other kinds of things. It was un impossible to miss Michael. Um, I always say a couple of words about Michael's publication legacy in his uh, relatively brief career. He had a, a prodigious publication uh, record. As this mentioned, 70 refereed articles, uh, 60 between 1989 and 1999, his very untimely death. 13 is the sole author, and 25 is the author. And that little other thing there are all of the Cedar Storm studies, which you faithfully run every year at the annual Cedar meeting, would start with a list of everything that had been promised from the last workshop, would tick off all the things that people were doing, and then by the end, we would make a new list which Michael would very dutifully remind us of the next time. So he was really a driving force behind uh, trying to understand ionospheric storms. And if Michael, as I think we're going to hear today in the lecture, if Michael had the tools, the observation tools that we had now, one can imagine where this would have been even uh, today. Um, I mentioned the collaboration legacy. Uh, uh, 70 publications, 35 as a lead author, and it's a little hard to see, but that's just some of his co-authors. So again, he was a real community researcher. Worked with everyone in the community. Um, his hallmark was ionospheric disturbances in space weather. Um, this is an article uh, with Tim Fuller Rowell about strides and made in understanding space weather at Earth, and that was from 1997 in EOS. And then this very landmark paper, which was uh, published in the last year of his life, Ionospheric Storms, a review. And I always like to visit this paper every year to see how many people have cited it. I think this is remarkable. Between last year and this year, the number of citation counts went up by about 100 for a paper that is 20 years old. So again, a testament to really the enduring legacy of his work. And um, not only was he doing disturbance time and space weather kinds of research, but he also did a lot in ionospheric climatology with the group here, uh, specifically like Shen Rong, uh, Zhang, and John Holt who were doing regional and local models and empirical models based on our data that again then formed the background basis for a lot of disturbance level information. This is the climatology on which space weather rides. So Michael was also a pioneer there. We put a lot of effort at Haystack into education and public outreach and he spent 10 years as a very faithful RU mentor, mentoring an undergraduate every year and published papers with them. So not only mentoring them, but getting them to publication. Three of them here, Larry Pullman, who was a student in 1998. Olivier Vitas, who was not an RU student, but a visitor, and is now actually uh, on the ExoMars team in Europe. And uh, YK Tung, who was a RU student back in 1991. All of them resulted in referee journal articles. So um, just to remind you of his legacy, we miss him quite a bit, and his smile, and his uh, uh, optimistic and future-looking collaborations, but I think his legacy is continuing on with this lecture. So I'd like to introduce this year's speaker, who is Professor Dolores Knipp, and these are some of her particulars. Dolores was very kind enough to join us today from the University of Colorado, where she's a research professor. She's also a senior research associate at NCAR's High Altitude Observatory. Um, she happens to be the editor of the Aging Space Weather Journal and Space Weather Quarterly, and many of, our, many of us in the field know her, from, know, us, know her from her work in space weather, and I know that's going to be some of the subject of what she's talking about today. She also spent a good amount of time as a professor of physics and director of meteorology at the Air Force Academy, teaching many, many students. She's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and she did her work, her PhD work, at UCLA. 
So, without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Professor Dolores Knipp, who will give the 20th annual Juan Santo Lecture. Thank you. What an incredible honor to, uh, to be asked to talk about uh, Michael and his, uh, his work, especially at the, at the 20th year, where we can, I think, get a kind of a global sense of what his influence was and, and uh, still is. And I noticed on the, on the slide that you uh, flashed up, uh, you had scientist, colleague, friend, and mentor. And I thought I'd add one more word to that uh, in a moment when I bring up uh, kind of my version of that slide, uh, the word influencer. I was at a strategic planning meeting yesterday, and, and one of the things you do in your first strategic planning exercise is to go, well, what are the organizations or what are the entities that are going to influence uh, and, and guide us forward? And that was pretty much Michael, I think. So, um, I'm going to do both a retrospective and, and, a, and forward look at uh, some of his influences, and I'm actually going to give you more than you paid for. I said 250 years of extreme storms. Uh, I've been doing uh, some literature, some historical work, and we can now extend this back to about 2,500 years, so I want to show you some of the materials that, that were, have come to light recently, especially out of uh, Asia, that show us just how profound the space weather influence was even 2,500 years ago. So not only that, about extreme space weather storms, uh, Michael really, really dug into that when the terminology started being used. He wrote that EOS article. Uh, and then uh, kind of a question, what has the ionosphere been up to? Or maybe what has it been down to? So I, I want to weave that story in because uh, Michael and I, we, we didn't really go head to head, but I was uh, a, kind of a late developing graduate student, um, PhD uh, out of UCLA after many years in the Air Force. I would show up at these CEDAR meetings st starting in 87, I think was when I first, uh, when I first came around. And, and he would be talking about storms and I would be talking about storms and it was like we were on different planets. And, and so I want to see if I can't finally resolve why we had such uh, rather divergent views and it was, because I was a novice, basically. But um, my recollection, so 1988 to 1999, I think he actually started here at Millstone in 1988, did he not? Somewhere close, Somewhere close to that. That was, uh, 87 would have been the first year that I was actively a, a graduate student in the community. So uh, he came to Millstone Hill and, and I came into the world of, of storms and space weather at about the same, same time. He had, at that time, much more of a whole world view of the ionosphere than I did then and perhaps ever will. Uh, but what I remember, my recollections of him and looking over his papers, he really loved Millstone Hill and, its, and the data that came from this radar at L equals four approximately. And you know he had a very long-term study of what did space weather look like from a radar perspective from a single location over many, over many, uh, many months, many solar cycles. He was really intent on finding ways to merge data from similar instruments, from other uh, radars, uh, and then he became fascinated as Art Richmond uh, developed the technique and many of his uh, young protégés uh, continued to work with data assimilation, bringing in different instruments uh, to help us understand what the upper atmosphere uh, electrodynamics looked like, um, and especially images. And I, I kind of recall having a conversation with him about this March 89 storm. He actually wrote 
a paper on the March 89 storm, but not this March 89 storm, not the one with the great red aurora, because apparently he couldn't extract all the data he wanted from the radar on the way he wanted, and so he looked at the storm that preconditioned for this event. So his March 89 storm paper is March 7th through 10th, I think. There was a lot of preconditioning going on for the event that created this uh, red aurora. He had many other things that he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to look at not only fr things for what was driving the ionosphere from above, but he also had a pretty good sense that there was something going on from below. Uh, we now know that, and I hope I'll show one of uh, Shenrong's uh, videos right at the end to show, give you just a sense of what is going on, probably coming up uh, from below. We did share this interest in great auroral storms. He wanted me to look at as many as I could, and I w was brought into the kind of the um, National Science Foundation space weather efforts uh, and asked as, not that I ever did a postdoc, doc, but uh, as, as a post-PhD student, to try and lead the community to fully look at an event, which turned out to be the November 1993 event. Michael still wanted it to be the May 1992 event because it had a red aurora. And it, it was so close, but there were no solar wind data. And I eventually had to choose a different storm, and I think he was always a little disappointed about that. <laughs> oh, well. Um, and then, as I said, he had this view of negative and positive storm phases for the ionosphere that at the time I just didn't have quite the background to understand. But I've recently been teaching this material, and I, I, it is amazing to me what we have now learned what he could see from relatively few measurements scattered here and there and what we now see from the view of GPS. And, and Thea, I think you're a co-author on, on the paper, that uh, Evan Thomas's paper. Uh, so I have those results uh, here. They're just, to me, finally I understand negative and positive phase storms by virtue of, of that of Michael's desire to be able to, to see it all the time, everywhere. But uh, let's, uh, a long introduction, but let me tell you a little bit about this presentation. It's a woven presentation. It doesn't have a first then and then that. Yeah, I'm trying to really piece together uh, contributions that Michael had and hopes that Michael had for um, what could be uh, understood about the system that he liked so much. So I'm going to give a very gentle introduction to the ionosphere. I think everyone here could probably give a more technical uh, discussion of that, but uh, recognizing that, uh, that this is being broadcast and I believe there are a number of graduate, undergraduate or beginning graduate students, I thought I would keep it at a gentle level. Um, and also talk about its relationship to these red aurora, which I promised in the abstract, and uh, also to think about why it is that we care about the ionosphere. I also promised to do a little bit of a, of a retrospective, and I, I will extend that uh, in the middle of the talk, and then eventually get to what have we learned in this past century and uh, it is not only what have we learned about red aurora, but what we have learned about the ionosphere because we've been forced to study it due to its impacts on our affinity and addiction to technology. So we'll go into that and then finally just a few examples at the end of what the ionosphere has been up to or, or uh, down to. So an image here, another image of a red aurora. Um, I did not completely look, I did not look at exactly what the exposure time was. Red aurora fascinate me, they're on my bucket list of, of things to do. I have not seen one with my own eyes, not that I've seen many aurora, but they are rather difficult to see unless they are extreme red aurora uh, because the intensity is low in general and because human eyes are just not tuned to the red light the way we are to, to the kind of the green and orange light. So sometimes you're going to see pictures of these beautiful red aurora that you could not actually see yourself because your eyes don't have the ability to, to uh, integrate. But this one was taken in Australia and uh, what was a moderate to strong storm, March 17th 
2013. It was actually a modest, moderate storm, maybe a DST minus 134, but it certainly gave us the opportunity to have a pretty worldwide view of what happened uh, in moderate storms during this past solar cycle. Okay, for a gentle introduction, um, we have the Earth and its very thin atmosphere, at least thin in terms of what we think of as a well-mixed atmosphere where we could actually breathe, going up uh, above about 40 kilometers we get to the stratosphere and then well beyond that we start getting into a region of the neutral atmosphere that is influenced greatly by solar radiation, short, wave, uh, <coughs> short wavelength photons uh, that can uh, ionize or excite um, neutral particles on the day side and end up producing a sphere of ions, an ionosphere. Well, it certainly is ionized weakly to the point of a tenth of a percent or so, um, but it is not quite spherical. It is definitely more uh, ionization on the day side. A lot of that ionization uh, recombines, and so on the night side we end up typically with something that's probably not exactly a shell either, but at least we have a remaining layer, a layer that stays uh, at night because the atmosphere at those high levels is so tenuous that it's very hard for an electron and a positive ion to come back uh, together. So in many cases we actually get to uh, we get to know that there is an ionosphere and there are a lot of radio communicators who uh, take full use, uh, full value of that. And I should have taken, gone on to my little movie here, which I will just play for the benefit of those who not quite sure how ionization works, but what we just brought in here was a solar was a solar photon of a short wavelength. It interacted with an electron in one of the outer shells of mostly, typically, it's uh, oxygen that is in uh, the upper atmosphere, since the upper atmosphere is stratified by by mass. So when we get into the regions where the ionization is really, really effective and ongoing, typically that interaction is going on between a short energy photon, uh, a short wavelength photon, and a uh, oxygen atom. So we end up with a, with a system that is layered for reasons that I'll come back to eventually. So those little gaps in there, while not to scale, are meant to indicate that there really are places where the amount of ionization and the root of the ionization is slightly different. Now, why do we care about that? It's because these layers of ionization facilitate, or in some cases inhibit, radio communication. And irregularities in the ionization affect high frequency and GPS satellite Earth transmissions. Uh, and we all know how reliant we are on GPS. I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for the GPS that got me here in the dark last night. So uh, believe me, I am well aware of how important that is. Who cares? Well, just about everybody. Uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization has just mandated, oh, it's been in, in, uh, something going on for the last several months, but uh, just this past week, the major space weather forecasting centers of the world have taken on the mantle of actually forecasting for the civil aviation uh, community. And I have been uh, developing some of the materials for the Space Weather Prediction Center. So their uh, customers are going to be aviators, navigators, uh, uh, mariners, uh, certainly we know that DOD has been interested in these effects for a very long time and for any of us that want to know precisely when we are or where we are, these things are important. So I, I slammed together or crushed together in this cartoon and I didn't do it, this is actually from a contractor working for NOAA to put together a simple diagram that basically says there is a region, regions of the upper atmosphere where there are free electrons. There are just as many free ions, if you will, positively charged. I didn't put them on here because I wanted to emphasize 
uh, the role of the electrons, but this is an electrically neutral layer, so it's, it's not a charged layer. But these free electrons have the unique ability to respond to the frequencies used by radio communicators uh, in their efforts to talk to aircraft or ships or uh, satellites above the Earth. And those uh, electrons can oscillate at frequencies that are associated with that communication. So that means there's going to be an interaction with those radio waves, sometimes an absorption, sometimes an outright redirection. Uh, good ways to lose communication. So let me come back to, uh, to this now and expand upon this cartoon and show you something that is called an electron density profile. So we're going to count up by at altitude the number of free electrons that there are, usually it's in per cubic centimeter, sometimes you're going to see it in per cubic meter, uh, but we're going to look at that and we'll find that there are sort of characteristic curves. There are lumps and bumps. There are places where there are more free electrons and then it falls away, more again, more again. And then ultimately as we go to the very upper regions of the atmosphere, fewer and fewer, and that's simply because there's less and less material to be ionized at, uh, at that level. If that is a, that's a day side uh, profile, if we go to a night side, it looks a little bit different. We get a bite out here, and that is because in these regions below about 200 kilometers, the um, atmosphere is dense enough that if ionization is no longer being produced, it has the opportunity to combine or recombine and will actually at night typically get a little bit of a bite out. But sometimes we see a spike here where we think it ought to be just falling away. And those spikes can be created either by meteors and meteor ablation or can be created by auroral particles that come into the uh, upper atmosphere, and that is going to be kind of the focus of uh, what I'll talk about next. So this cartoon view of the sun is for the quiet sun without a geomagnetic field. Uh, and I'll just do one more uh, comment about that, and that is these layers, because they have different densities, as I've already shown you, uh, have the ability to interact with different wavelengths of radio waves. And every time a radio wave sees a gradient in the electron density, it will turn a little bit. That allows a radio wave to appear to reflect, perhaps bounce back, back down to the conducting Earth or partially conducting Earth and bounce again. And we get these skips and hops of radio uh, uh, waves that we all take for granted as radio communication. So uh, we have found, this has become our workhorse, our tool since 1901, finding ways to communicate by either changing the frequency or changing the attack angle to the uh, ionosphere, but we rely on being able to get radio waves to propagate from here and to get them over there to a place we want them to be, as long as the ionosphere is well behaved but there are times when it may not be so well behaved. So let's come back now to this graphic and I'll just over, <coughs> excuse me, overlay it again and say the next thing we're going to do is look at what happens if we add a geomagnetic field influence. And that will be with the geomagnetic field now added in the electrons are free electrons, the charged particles, some from the sun, but mostly most of them coming from the magnetotail, can, act, can uh, spiral around but be accelerated in to the polar regions, and that forms what we call the auroral zone. It forms uh, typically at a latitude of about uh, 65 to 70 degrees, most nights it's there in some diffuse way, but there are times when these zones really light up. And they light up with different colors. 
uh, depending on how energetic the particles are that are coming in from the various regions. The most energetic particles, uh, well, lower energy particles interact perhaps at the higher regions of the upper atmosphere with atomic oxygen and excite the oxygen to glow red. That excited electron, it never leaves the oxygen atom, but it, uh, it's in an excited state, and when it drops down, it gives off red light. More energetic particles, which there's usually a distribution, will go, go deeper into the atmosphere and interact with, again, atomic oxygen, but, uh, and they would create red light there as well, but the state at which uh, that is required to give red light is one that requires that there not be a collision for a rather long time on the order of a minute. Well, there are lots of collisions going on down here. So the state that we see in terms of its uh, a light output tends to be green. So we tend to get red and green, and then sometimes we see red at the bottom as well because the most energetic electrons can interact with nitrogen which is sitting towards the bottom of the system since it's heavier. So, a picture. The auroral emissions viewed from the ground. This is viewed from Alaska. Um, and you notice there's the red. So probably we're, t we're seeing it off at an angle. And the green that would be right below this is probably hidden by the, the horizon. So we're, we're seeing up into the atmosphere, maybe 300 kilometers or so. But there are also some striations uh, that are green, and it may simply be because there are uh, our viewing angle or simply because uh, we may have had a real uh, pulse of, of uh, energetic electrons uh, coming in. We don't really know. It could be viewing angle. It could simply be a pulse of, of energy coming in. These low energy particles are striking the upper atmosphere and leaving these neutral particles in an excited state. And we get this uh, multicolored emission. This is not unusual for anyone who has gone and seen an aurora uh, during a, a substorm or a geomagnetic storm. It looks like. Um, so, what we do notice, the, the additional thing that we notice is these striations. It do, does appear to, that there's some kind of field alignment. They're aligned with the magnetic field, and that is, in fact, true. These curtains and rays do line with the magnetic field, even during quiet times. During more active times, we not only have the behavior that I just described, but we have mass and magnetic field that escapes or, in, many ca in some cases, is ejected into space, and as a result, we create even <coughs> more charged particles with more energy to uh, come into the system. And so here we have that same diagram kind of repeated, just to give you a, a, a sense of, of this uh, now uh, system, more, uh, system more excited. And what we get to see from that, not only from the ground, but also from space, now that we have the ability to look at images from um, space, from the International Space Station, we actually get to see this structure over probably a good fraction of the auroral zone. Still the red on top, the green below, and the, some of these um, striations indicating field aligned. This system, once we get into a situation where mass and uh, magnetic field are uh, really ejected from the solar wind, put enough energy into this part of the system uh, impulsively that we no longer have a smooth or I, uh, 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 stri uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we no longer have a stratified ionosphere. Rather, what we now know, much of it based on GPS, is that once energy starts coming into the system impulsively, the, the ionization that is created, and not that, not that this red and green light is ionization, it's excitation, but associated with this is also ionization, and the ionization starts to get very lumpy and bumpy. And so the striated system become, or the stratified system 
becomes one that be very challenging for, for radio propagation. If we take this now as kind of looking for a global view before I go into the history of what some people, some folks have written about these red aurora, what we know is we can see the system as almost a full oval uh, as it starts to be excited by some kind of energy input. We see essentially the substorm, what we call a substorm expansion phase here. This crescent here is essentially the day side of the Earth that is glowing. And here we see the auroral zone emitting and invisible. Uh, and as the energy adds in, the entire auroral zone expands to lower latitudes in both hemispheres. And so we have probably doubled or tripled the area of the region inside the auroral zone by the time we get to this. And I believe this was one of the storms, I believe it was not the March 89 storm, uh, but it was one that was uh, in that cycle. And so we get to see what a, a very large storm looks like uh, in a global sense from just the auroral view. But we don't from this kind of view, get to see what's going on in the rest of the ionosphere. Michael very much wanted to see that, but um, we just did not have all of the technologies that made that possible for him. So I'll give you a little uh, kind of a summary here where we are, uh, not only in the talk, but where we are in present day. We have the aurora. It's a a marker, if, will, if you will, of the ionosphere, but it is not the entire ionosphere. It's something that we do as humans get to see. It shows up as glows and pillars and dynamic rays and curtains. Um, it is newsworthy. Uh, it's often a curiosity when uh, the Weather Channel or anyone else gets a hold of it. It's a tourist attraction, and uh, they are objects of research. Uh, and Michael was very interested in those. If we go over to the ionosphere, of which the aurora essentially show off, it's an integral part of geospace, and it's the interface between Earth's neutral atmosphere and space. So interfaces, boundaries are always really interesting places. Uh, the ionosphere is a workhorse of our radio communication. And now in our GPS-enabled world or GNSS-enabled world, it is also a significant modulator of, of our precision navigation timing signals. And that's a key aspect of much of what is driving the research now. In previous years, what could be seen was the aurora, and it was viewed as omens, which I will talk about in a moment. And it certainly evoked a sense of unease and fear and, oh, something bad is about to happen, we should do something. I will argue during storm time, the ionosphere is doing the same thing. Uh, it makes some people very uneasy that the signals that they rely on may not get to where they need to be or they won't get there in the form that they need to be them. So there are certainly a number of people, including many in DOD, for whom the ionosphere has become the new aurora. So, now let's go back in time. Let's go back 2,600 years to a time when people wrote on clay tablets, which I think was possibly a marvelous time because it would have required you to be very brief, very concise. And sometimes I really, as, a, as an editor, have wished for con more conciseness. But it, this is a sort of a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, so 10 of your thumbnails on a side, on a side. And it's one of a series of very carefully reconstructed astronomical observations uh, from uh, the area around Babylon. The, the text reads, on the night of the 29th, there was a red glow that flared up in the west. This was in the 37th year of the reign of, the, of King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon. See, I was going to practice that, and I didn't. Um, in the modern calendar, this would be the 12th to the 13th of March, 567, before the Common Era. Okay, so it is an equinox event. We know that's when auroras tend to be at their maximum because of the way Earth's magnetic field is aligned with the Sun's magnetic field. Um, Stevenson and all went back and really did dig into this, and they actually 
recalculated what the magnetic field would look like and where this would fall. So it would be at about 41 degrees magnetic latitude at that epoch. And the frequency of such a, an aurora would be about one-tenth per year or about once per solar cycle. Okay, so this is probably a great red aurora. Okay, um, there are uh, just recently published uh, in Aunt J Letters some indications of about a century before this, in 660 um, B, uh, before the Common Era, and that those they're more astrological because uh, these kinds of things were meant for advising kings about what should be should or should not happen in the future. Uh, and you know how likely their their kingdom was to survive, uh, and so that was going on long before this. And so in 660 BC, apparently there was another red aurora, or at least reports similar to this, and that can also be associated with a very strong solar energetic particle event that has been documented in in uh, ice cores and what have you. So we probably have been going for 26 to 2700 years in documentation on this. Well, let's lurch forward. Let's lurch forward to 771, 772 uh, in the Common Era. And uh, here is, uh, we've, we're now writing on papyrus. Uh, and it looks like there's some scribbles in the margin. I mean, who would do that to a library book? But this, or, this is actually the author drawing what he uh, describes here. So these are margin, margin sketches found in the chronicles of uh, Joshua the Stylite who lived uh, in eastern Turkey. And it was seen at harvest time occupying the entire northern side from western corner to eastern corner. It had blood red scepter, a green one, a black one, and a saffron colored one. Very dynamic aurora. Uh, it was going from below to above there have been many uh, descriptions of that, uh, like uh, candle flames, if you will. Uh, and when one scepter was extinguished, another one went up. And when someone was looking at it, it changed into 70 shapes. I haven't put all of the accumulated records that I have here. There's one from uh, Chile, uh, much more recently, that talked about 40 serpents in the sky. Uh, same, same kind of thing. So we've been, now we start drawing these, these arch-shaped uh, structures. And then we'll come forward a little bit more, and now going to East Asia. Um, 1204, Common Era, red vapor in the sky at night. This is in February, uh, and it appeared with a white cloud, probably a white pillar, mixed in, and uh, this was considered to be a very rare disaster. And here we have the first documented space weather effect on local society. We decided not to take our pilgrimage because it was probably a bad omen. Okay. What's interesting about this one is that it is uh, occurred again. The previous day had been sunny and quite windy. Uh, it was time evening fell. Red vapor appeared, it was back, it was like a distant mountain burning, and it was very dreadful. Okay, note that this date is well before Galileo had, had coined the term Aurora Borealis, where Aurora means dawn, so this would be northern dawn, and they're definitely talking about lights in the northern um, uh, latitudes. So now, in the, in the idea of continuing on with the sketches, let's take a look at a fan-shaped aurora. Here we are in 1770. Uh, there have been arguments in, in the paper. I was a co-author on, I'm a co-author on one of these papers. Somewhere down here, I'm a co-author. Um, so here we have it. There's another red vapor in the sky at night. It's like fiery light, like a vermilion sand in the north and the golden color rising up inside the polar star. So now we get to a place where we can actually see from where we know these people were, what the vertical extent of the aurora was. Um, and, and a painting appears. Uh, there's a series of these kinds of texts in Japanese that describe these types of events. This was a worldwide event uh, recorded around the world uh, at very low latitudes and was probably a Carrington-like storm a century before 
the Carrington event. Uh, this figure was as it was watched at midnight. Notice it's red, but it has these white kinds of spikes. We'll come back. The picture that I like drawn by a different artist for the same event is this one, which I am going to blow up for you because this one had to be one that was so striking for the artist. So you've seen the big picture. So now I'm blowing this up. Here's the red aurora with the white stripes, viewed as seen near midnight. Now there are all of these people out. There are some people that appear to be working as if it were dawn. Some person over here is still asleep, I think. Others are just out. Some are pointing. There's a dog here, I think. There are people with children here, lots of people pointing. But what really fascinates me about this is these people on their roofs. And I, for the longest time, I could not fathom what they were doing until I looked closely and saw this person down here in the stream with his bucket. And they are taking water up to their roofs to wet down their roofs because of the fire that is coming over the hill. So now we get to see societal effects of space weather. Now, I will tell you this is my interpretation. I have not read the, the Japanese text, but it is almost certain that this is what is going on. There are people who are frightened. Uh, you know, pointing at it, and people just going about their business, and people trying to save their homes. We'll go forward. We will take a look at the Carrington event, but as seen from Australia. So here we have these red arches again. This figure I have not figured out yet. I, uh, we, I have seen a number of auroral pictures that have this arch, and this region filled in, and I'm still researching. I don't understand quite what that is, but here we are. This is from um, uh, near Melbourne, I believe. Uh, so this was the first time that sunspots, aurora, geomagnetism, and effects of earth currents were all put together, and we understood that, oh, there, there are impacts here. Impacts on telegraphs, impacts on train signaling. In this event, we're in the dusk sector, pre-midnight. Lights of the stars have been very much put to the background, but there are these beautiful rays through Pisces, and uh, a beautiful red arc appeared passing through the crown, and uh, just uh, more details on it. But uh, again, uh, an artist drawing, this actually appeared in a newspaper, or, or in, a, in a chronicle, if you will. All right. So I, I just wanted to set that scene. So now I'm going to do another hard lurch forward and say, let's move forward to the 20th century. We kind of stopped doing those amazing drawings, not completely, but we're a little bit more about you know, writing things down because we don't have to write in clay tablets anymore. So we're a little bit more descriptive. But not only did that happen, technologies really started to, to blossom. In fact, in 1981, Marconi developed, in 1899, he was actually doing skywave transmission. By 1901, he was doing transmission that involved the ionosphere. He just didn't know what, he didn't know why it would work. It's just that it did. He won the Nobel Prize in 1909, or at least shared it for that work. By 1919, uh, we actually had learned societies that were forming up to understand <clears throat> what kinds of issues there were with radio science and uh, use of uh, radio technology. That was after World War I, where a lot of use was being made of radio technology. In 1921, you may have read about this one recently, there was a super geomagnetic storm that clearly rivals the Carrington event. Uh, a number of fires, uh, let's see, there are train stations and uh, telegraph uh, stations that actually burned down during that event because of the earth currents that stopped through those. And there were very, there were a few radio impacts, but interestingly, the radio impacts that were listed were, well, this really improved radio propagation, which seemed very odd. That seems like it's going the wrong way. But what that tells you is that the particle precipitation went so deep into the atmosphere that it effectively created an E layer at the D region, 
down. So rather than being at 110 kilometers, it was closer to probably 70 or 80 kilometers. And the longer wavelength radio that we were using, which were lower frequency, was enabled by that. So things for a while were good. And everybody was saying, oh, wow, this is great. You know, radio works. Well, until it didn't. Okay, so we started realizing in the mid-1930s and probably even earlier than that that radio was being impacted. As a matter of fact, in 1939, U.S. Department of Commerce actually initiated a forecasting radio transmission and the forecast of the maximum usable frequency, the frequency that you could use that would not get sent out to the ionosphere that could actually turn over and be used. In World War II, new use of radio, radio detection and ranging, uh, and immediately it begins to suffer solar interference. Now that's not a direct ionosphere, but it just tells you that the technologies that we're uh, dealing with are subject to a lot of concerns. There's a very new paper that says the bombs that were being dropped in Europe and elsewhere were so disturbing to the atmosphere that they created radio uh, perturbations that are now being found in the ionosphere by going back and looking at old um, um, uh, ionosons. Then I put a, red, a blue line here because in 57, 58, we, we entered the space age. Radio signals were the absolute key to uh, maintaining uh, control and, uh, and interaction with our spacecraft. And then we went through solar cycle 19 where we had super magnetic storms and we started seeing even additional uh, concerns with different types of impacts. And we can, we can kind of go on and just, and it goes on and on. I'm going to stop, well, I'm, just, I'm going to continue on. In 1967, we'll take a brief visit there to find out what happened in 1967 because about anything that could go wrong with the ionosphere did. Plus, and I will just uh, an interlude here, uh, my thoughts on this. If, if humans can dream it, engineer it, and build a technology for it, nature will find a way to disrupt it. And then the engineers come in and start all over again. So, before I get to the 67 event, let me just point out to you that DOD uh, and, uh, and uh, civilian researchers thought that understanding the electron density profile was so important that as soon as, let's see, this was a satellite in 1962, the Alouetta, uh, Canadian-American uh, uh, collaboration, and we had for a long time been able to measure the electron density profile up to about this peak value right here. But once we get past that peak, then any radio signals that we send out to sound the atmosphere go to space, they don't come back, and they don't tell us anything. So how to figure out what's going on above? Well, you need to send in a radio signal from above from a satellite. You put the two of them together and you can build up the electron density profile all the way out in currently to actually several Earth radii. But we notice that there's, the one thing that's very characteristic is that there tends to be a peak density between three and 400 kilometers. That is the density that exists day and night. It's the key to long, long distance radio transmission. But there are times when the red aurora or any aurora or any extreme solar event comes in that you actually disturb this ionosphere and maybe you add an order of magnitude more density. Or later, as Michael was prone to study, there in a few hours it turns out that you turn this into this and you really reduce the electron density. And you go, well, you know, what's a few orders of magnitude of electron density amongst friends? It is the difference between being able to communicate long distance and not. So we are relying on these nicely organized stratified regions to do our radio propagation. And if this happens or this happens, then what we have to do is adjust. 
Well, you'd like to have a forecast of, oh, now we need to adjust. So you can either adjust by changing your frequency, doing a lot of things, and uh, the ham radio operators, everybody wants to know what kinds of adjustments should they make. How do I get my signal from point A to point B? Well, maybe I need to dial up the frequency, but if I do put more energy in, then some of my signal is going to go out. Not very useful. Or if I don't, maybe, uh, maybe I can actually just bend, uh, uh, change the uh, attack angle, if you will. But where will my signal end up? Maybe not really where I want it to be. Or if things get really exciting, maybe you're just not going to communicate. So I will leave you with that. And now come to the great solar storm of May 1967. It was an extraordinary solar eruption, actually a series of them, that caused disruptions across all portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I will tell you, this is an event that gives you pause and makes you realize we are actually very lucky to be here, just because of this event. It came out of McMath Region 8818. Uh, it was an event that already showed itself to be very active as it rotated around the eastern limb of the sun. It had many uh, uh, sunspot groups uh, in, uh, I guess this is one active, place, one active region, but many spots, uh, some of, with very differing polarities, even within the main body. And here is 1829, 1840, and 1844. These are H alpha. And you can see the H alpha, the flare ribbon starting to develop. And uh, pretty soon you see not much of anything. The entire region here has completely erupted. It was a white light flare, an X ray flare. Van Allen was actually flying spacecraft that could see that in 1967. It was a three brilliant H alpha flare. Energy in the extreme ultraviolet, we can get that from the, the impacts on the radio, although we didn't measure it. Um, and it caused extreme radio frequency interference, more than three orders of magnitude increase above background. This is a measurement from, uh, I believe this is from Sagamore Hill. Uh, and uh, I, the, the technical sergeant who made these measurements and kept this system running during this time actually received an Air Force award for doing so. Because uh, keeping this, this microwave system under control and managing to get this information was no small feat. So we have what amounted to three extraordinary X-ray and radio bursts. Uh, and at 606 megahertz, it was greater than 370,000 solar flux units, where a typical value is 40. So we were, were just completely off scale at 606. The reason I point that out is because DOD was operating systems at 440 megahertz. They were the ballistic missile early warning systems. Uh, and so we'd, I have not seen a 440 megahertz measurement, but everything I've seen about the distribution of these flares indicates it was just as bad, if not worse, at 440 megahertz. So in comes the flare. Um, and if I'm looking at the ionosphere at this point, just looking at the kinds of radio waves that we might actually try and uh, uh, investigate, uh, suddenly their ability to transmit is, is, is off scale. We, we just have no ability to really uh, do any kinds of transmission and Amazingly enough, we're getting all of this input into the system. What that is is radio frequency interference. And our radars, the ballistic missile early warning system, was up and running in 1967. As a matter of fact, it had been developed in late 50s, early 60s, and 10 days it had been undergoing a major upgrade. 10 days before, DOD had signed off and said, boy, this, this great new uh, version of this system is great. Nothing will get into it, ready to go. And off it went. And so when all of those systems went down at once, the thought was, well, we've had a system that's been upgraded and it's fully functional. 
there is reason to believe, they had reason to believe at the time, that there might have been some jamming, some interference. I will tell you more about that in a moment. But this system, if you remember back to the 60s, its job was to detect incoming missiles and aircraft uh, from over the pole. So the USSR and the Western Hemisphere, the Americans, were in deep into the Cold War. Our situation was tense at that time because three days in advance of all of this, President Nassar of Egypt had thrown out the UN peacekeepers from, from the Sinai Desert. And that was the peacekeepers that were keeping the Egyptians and the Israelis from going to war. So out they go, and, and no one knew what, what weapons were in play at that time. So we're now talking May 21, May 22. And on May 23, conveniently or inconveniently, here comes this jamming of our 440 megahertz system. The war gamers had always said that the first thing that would happen during a, 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 an aircraft or missile invasion would be that the systems would be jammed. Okay, they're jammed. What to do? We have our force, our B-52s, sitting here on their various aprons at SAC bases at the ready. No one knows what's going on. Well, that's not quite true. I will tell you who knew what was going on. So the view at, at SAC and throughout much of NORAD at the time was that, the, that there was jamming going on, uh, and that was essentially viewed as an act of war, anything that fully jammed the systems. So what happened? Aircraft moved to runway positions. They held there with their engines running. Part of that is because just a few months before, not because, they held with their engines uh, at the end of the runway because we had in place at NORAD Cheyenne Mountain Complex a new solar forecasting unit. Uh, it was uh, those guys, they were all guys then, uh, were, were fully aware that the sun had been active the day before and there was, the duty forecaster was getting information coming in from SAC Peak that said there had been the um, uh, solar flare that I showed you before. So fortunately, that had been a slow weather day. The solar forecaster had mentioned to the terrestrial forecaster who did the weather briefing, and I was that person at one time in, in Cheyenne Mountain Complex, that, you know, the sun's pretty active. If you don't have anything else to talk about, tell the generals that the sun's pretty active. Thankfully, that word got through because, well, we're all still here. Uh, and so the reason I think we're all still here is because, for two reasons. First of all, some word got through tonight to NORAD that maybe this was a natural event. The other reason that this we're all still here is because calmer minds prevailed and realized that uh, this is 13 megahertz, but across a wide range of, of uh, activity, uh, of frequencies, we had no signal. We had absolutely no way to communicate with aircraft that would have been launched to bring them back had we figured out in time that this really was not an attack. Yeah. Okay, so who were these people? So these are the solar forecasters. Uh, Colonel Anderson died about four years ago. I've had the distinct pleasure of meeting uh, Colonel Lee Snyder. Uh, he and his wife still live up in, uh, in Maine. Uh, they are good friends. Oh, they good friends. They are in the same community as George uh, Sisko and Nancy Crooker. Uh, I correspond fairly regularly with uh, Al Ramsey. He is still a huge proponent of uh, space weather. Uh, and so Lee was on duty at the time. He was the one that was getting word out to calm everybody down. Uh, Al Ramsey was the scientific services officer. He and Lee together had to do the after action reports that basically, I'm going to back up here, allow them to understand that what had gone on here in, with these three radars that were pointing towards the sun, remember it's May, the polar cap, northern polar cap is towards the sun, and even though these systems had been fully vetted as absolutely nothing can get through, nothing could get through their primary, nothing could get through their uh, secondary lobes, but they had not filtered the back lobes. This 
three order of magnitude increase in radio frequencies got into the back lobes of these radars and essentially brought them down. They recovered pretty quickly, but it was because these guys knew enough about space weather at the time that they could tell <laughs> leaders that the system would probably recover in a few tens of minutes, but the dayside comm challenges would continue. The polar cap outage challenges would uh, develop and go on for a long time. And the major magnetic storm was in the offing in 36 to 48 hours. Well, we all know that there are many factors that come in. They were just darn lucky, everything verified. Maybe not darn lucky, but, but we know that we've had times, in fact, it was the 1972 event that I won't have time to talk about, that we forecast all of this incoming stuff and nothing happened that was visible. But that's for a different talk. Okay. These aurora, this, so this created extreme radio disruptions, aurora as far south as Georgia and New Mexico, that was a red aurora. And interestingly enough, I believe this is not a direct quote from Mike Mandelo's paper, but Mike, you said in one of your papers that the next morning, coming around where the ionosons were going to be looking for the appearance of the lower ionosphere at sunrise, it didn't show up. And so the question is, how can the ionosphere not show up if you have had all of this extreme activity? And that is, that is something that intrigued me. And Michael tried to explain how you could get a negative effect in the ionosphere when all of this extra electron density had been created. Apparently, I just wasn't listening. It took me 20 years to listen or learn. Uh, so let me just, uh, out in the interest of time, let me skip through this. Let me tell you, however, that the particles that came in from the sun did, in fact, get into the polar zones and kept the radars. So the radars went back to functioning, but their radar signal was not making it through the ionosphere because early on the ionosphere and the polar regions had had thickened and dropped down. And so those radars that were used in their sort of spare time to track satellites were no longer able to track the, the satellites, which had gotten sort of misplaced or lost. And so there was a huge impact across the board for this event. So we have a positive storm developing. Then we had a negative storm that went into full force, and then we had essentially not much radio communication going at all. We also had, amazingly enough, Hakia, who some of you know from his uh, satellite drag work, was using Nun Baker cameras to look at the minimum no a few satellites that we had and basically look at what had happened with the temperature of the atmosphere during that time. It had been nominal up to the time of storm arrival, and then within a few hours, a huge spike at every level. It increased 400 Kelvin and then dropped by 500 Kelvin. So what had happened there, we are now knowing, this is work that I've been doing with, with students for a while, is that this is, appears to be the maybe now the second recorded overcooling event. So many particles came into the upper atmosphere that it excited a trace gas that causes the atmosphere to cool and cool very rapidly. It's nitric oxide, which Bill Burke told me one time he didn't study because he didn't like the chemistry teacher that he had way back when. Is that, okay. Okay, I, I, he admits it. I, I, I have it in an email too, if anybody wants to see it. So he said he didn't do this kind of work. But, but this, kind of, this was being measured because at the time, the situation was so tense that we had actually, in response to a Russian launch that was a reconnaissance spacecraft that was going around taking a look at what was going on in the uh, Middle East, we had launched our very own satellite just 12 hours later. And that satellite, that surveillance satellite, happened to have on it the first neutral density 
measurements that were made in, in orbit. And that material, those satellites were actively deorbited, and then you go actually go get the recorder and, and, make the, and make the measurements. And I've got the dots on the various graphs, but I don't actually have the digits. Why would I tell you that other than it's really pretty darn interesting? And that is because when the ionosphere and the system becomes so disturbed and we create all of these extra electrons, the circulation behind the system actually causes those electrons to drift around. We create a fountain effect. We create circulations that support that and then circulations from the polar regions actually carry in air that is able to eat up or recombine with some of those electrons. And within a few hours, you get a decrease in electron density, which means your ability to communicate long distances is essentially reduced, which is why Michael was so concerned with those storms. Coming into the current age, what Michael would be delighted to see, I believe, is that there are now uh, locations, this is uh, coming out of Belgium, where we actually use the combination of GPS looking down, ionosons looking up, and over the course of days, we see the atmosphere thicken up. At night, it kind of goes away, it rises, thickens up again. Here, it really thickens up, the enhanced density. So here's a positive storm phase that Michael loved and the reduced density in the negative phase that gave him so many concerns. But he tried to explain those to me and I just, I could not wrap my mind around it until some work that was published, was it last year, Anthea? Is this Evan's, Evan Thomas's? A couple, years A couple years ago. Oh, 2016. Well, I, I, I'm forever being behind the curve. I was a little slow and I just saw this work. But what if you could bring together the same types of instruments just like Michael wanted, and look at their, uh, look at the storm impacts over and over. You can line up when the storm started. So what he did, what Evan and, uh, and the crew from here did, was basically look at what the GPS is seeing in terms of electron density. We'll start at the zero hour for about 150 storms, I think. We'll start them all up at the zero hour, and this pink right here says relative total electron content. How many extra electrons have you made? Well, you've made a few extra. At the three hour point, we're seeing that right around the edges of the auroral zones, we're seeing a lot more electron density. Great, six hours, same thing. Now it's really filling in. And these go down to about to 30 degrees, I think. But now at the ninth hour, things start to go negative. You see big regions here where you have decreased the electron density. This is the negative phase, and now those individual storms that Michael could see and piece together element by element, we're seeing with 150 storms with all of the GPS information all put together. Uh, to me, this is, you know, Michael would love this, absolutely love it. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over. I'll talk, I'll talk a bit more about uh, these. But I will, I'll stop right here and say we happen to know that these events are more intense in the summer. So they broke this study out and looked at just 55 of the storms that were summer storms, northern hemisphere tilted towards the sun. And sure enough, the depletions are much larger. What has happened is the, upper, the lower part of the upper atmosphere has already been lifted up because of heating by the sun. And it doesn't take much more to get the nitrogen from below to reach up and interact with the atomic oxygen and essentially shut down and even reduce the electron density. And so now we get to see in full form how long it takes six hours, nine hours for positive phase, and then you've got this what seems like forever reduction in your ability to communicate during the negative phase. Okay, uh, more on that. But now let me get to what uh, I have seen Shen Rung uh, uh, supporting, uh, reporting here, and what I know would, would just make Michael's heart go pity pat, and that is 
these kinds of things where now we're looking at GPS. This is the storm of early November 2017. Now we're starting to see, here's the United States, South America, Europe. What you're going to see in this is now waves in the total electron content developing in response. Come on. I'll go back. There we go. In response to storm onset. So pretty soon you're going to see waves of changes in electron con total electron content moving across the United States. And that on its lower regions will affect uh, radio communication, but those waves in total electron content also modulate the signals that we get from GPS. And so now GPS timing and um, uh, uh, precision location get sort of wavy behavior. Now, these kinds of changes may be not large enough to have huge effects on just general locationing, but you know, if you're really getting into precise uh, precision location, these kinds of things count. Okay, very close to finishing up here, but I want to come back. I want to come back to this. You can, I'm, I'm just addicted to these red aurora. Because I think red aurora are not the final answer on this. Remember I mentioned the white stripes? Is it really great red aurora, or is it the great white striations in them? This event was in the, it, it's, it's a painting that you'll find in the New York Public Library. It is listed as March 1st, 1872, but the researchers who went and looked at this said, looked at, where's the Big Dipper? Where are all these others? And said, you know, they got the date wrong on this. It's, it's actually February 3rd, 1872, which of course coincides with another great overall storm. Um, and then the question is, why are these white striations so prominent? So I'm going to just quote from a very recent uh, article that suggests that there are currents being driven by instabilities where the ring current is interacting with the plasma sphere. So kind of at a convenient place that might be seen by a local friendly radar. We hypothesize that these red lines are really stable auroral red arcs, just the low flux of electrons uh, coming in and interacting with the, with the system, and that the other colors reflect white pillars due to field aligned currents that are being carried by the precipitating electrons, and they are being pulsed by instabilities uh, that are at these boundaries between various plasma systems in the uh, magnetosphere. So we're seeing probably magnetospheric footprints or fingers reaching down into and creating structure in these great stable arcs, but then we have these things that are actually columns of electron densities uh, changing. And so I think uh, Michael would find this absolutely fascinating to go look at that. And so you've got places where there's electron density and then probably regions where uh, you don't have precipitating electrons. You're closing current, trying to get the system to, to close the current. And it, so it's not a full sheet. It's, it is very regularly spaced. And these, these kinds of drawings show up over and over again. There's, there has to be something physical to it. So, there is a very recent paper that makes some suggestions. I think it is open to investigation. Okay, so I'm a little off the top here. Students say that to me all the time. Okay, so 250 years of extreme space weather storms. What has the ionosphere been up to or down to? Lots of things. And the more technology we incorporate into our society, the more we are aware of it. So what are, what's to be done? We're not done yet with taking looks at long-term views from single locations like these marvelous radars that we have and merging those with similar instruments globally. And they don't have to be big radars. It's now possible, I think, to, to start to look at much smaller portable radars. Be able to assimilate the data from different instruments, especially the images, and do this and look at those cycles of 
solar cycle seasons or look at the seasons of uh, positive and negative storm phases, the diurnal variations, we certainly now have with the spacecraft that are um, uh, on orbit the ability to look at drivers from above and below. Sometimes we're even seeing that great explosions on Earth are detectable in the ionosphere. I think if we ever get a great storm again, that we'll actually have something to look at. We came pretty close in September 2017. Uh, I think there's a lot more to be learned about these individual negative and positive storms, but I'm so glad that I finally, finally figured out what Michael's trying to tell me, uh, more or less. And then uh, I, I think there's so much value in being able to look at multiple solar cycles, even going back 2,500 years, and seeing you know what drawings can we pull out of the archives what structures, what fingers are, are there in the, in the images. So this is, uh, this is Michael's legacy, and um, I, uh, I hope you found this interesting, and I'm happy to take questions. I may not be able to answer them, but I will happily take questions. Thank you very much. That was really right on target. I mean, you involved so much of what Mike Monsanto was really interested in, and uh, I don't remember him talking about stuff from 2,500 years ago, so that's a nice Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yep, yeah, may, may not be. just didn't have time. He, he may not have been this wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> question. We have questions, and I'll have Dolores repeat the question just so that it's on the microphone. Bill Burke. Have these striations? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. I believe, well, 1958, 59, there was a, a, I can't remember which of the great storms. Uh, it was there. Um, it's a very recent paper. I will try and get that uh, to you. But, but yes, so the, the Cataoka paper uh, actually lists a couple, three of these. Uh, and there was actual drawings and and imagery of one of these, so that's what motivated the paper. So the question is: Has spec was spectroscopy employed in that 1958 or 59 storm? Uh, I don't think it was spectroscopic. Um, it is filmed. There, it's, uh, film has been digitized, but I don't know that there was spectral information on that. They were able to see that there were these white regions uh, in, indicative of electron precipitation, but I don't think, I don't recall reading that there was spectroscopic information. You know, it, what, what, what this may well be is uh, green uh, sitting uh, in front of white. So, so you may be blending colors. Obviously, we need another one. We obviously need another one. So the question that was just asked was, what chemistry could possibly give those white pillars? And the answer is we don't quite know yet. It might be a viewing effect. It might be. And the Oh, uh, Japan. So the location of that 58, 59 was from Japan. No, uh, yeah, northern Japan. Uh, it's the Kataoka paper, uh, which I will happily uh, share with you. It's uh, Space Weather and Space Climate. And that was one of the last It was? Oh, uh, right. I'm trying to think if... Uh, so 1989, you know, the picture that I showed with Michael actually has a little bit of that striation. Um, but I don't think it was that quite that defined.
Oh, yes. Okay. So, uh, so kind of for the record, there's a comment that uh, there may have been some very interesting ham radio enhancements uh, in communication in the 50, what was the uh, uh, frequency range you were using? Well, I, I was interested in uh, 54 megahertz. 54 megahertz. So it was about the normal NUF. Uh -huh. And I noticed occasionally I could hear things going on in that frequency range. Okay. And as I say, I initially experienced putting on a call, I only had a 100 volt transmitter up the reader, getting thousands of people uh, basically answering that call. So it was a very strong uh, trans equatorial. Trans equatorial, yeah. Uh, It could, it certainly could, uh, certainly could be. So the, uh, the question really comes up is at 54 megahertz, would one expect during extreme storms that you would have this uh, great increase in, in uh, distance uh, transmission? And the answer is one, when you have a positive storm phase, the answer is yes. The, the kind of follow on, you know, clearly there's a, there's a group of, of us who in our spare time who are not watching football, uh, which is a little jab at my husband who's probably watching this. Uh, uh, so we, uh, you know, just put our noses in old dusty archives and that kind of thing. And we're always looking for places. And one thing that has come up is to go back to the ham radio community and get into those logbooks and find out what was happening because we think there's a wealth of information there. There's, uh, so the, the question is, what are the, some of the possible roles of preconditioning in creating these great, uh, in these great storms? And uh, I think you've hit the nail right on the head. Almost everything that I have seen that is associated with the great red aurora uh, is now documented as a preconditioned storm. There's a brand new paper out by David Bateller. Uh, who shows that the March 89 event, which was something that Michael already knew, was a preconditioned event. And that the uh, extreme uh, GICs, geomagnetically induced currents that created the downfall of the Hydro-Quebec system, did not occur at the minimum DST. It occurred as things were turning down. And so uh, in my mind, in reading that paper, it says that the system was somehow already set up to go. If you look at the 1921 event and now a recently published paper on the 1859 event, all of those had preceding storms. And they might have simply been a storm that was not particularly large. But one of the things that we're seeing is the role of having a storm come in that enhances the density around the magnetosphere for a number of hours before uh, the main driver comes in. Now that could be by another storm or it could be by the sheath ahead of a really fast moving storm. But when you bathe the magnetosphere uh, in that cold, dense plasma and it becomes integrated into the system, it seems like the system behaves a little bit uh, differently. And the 1972 event, you know, it arrived here in 14.6 hours, at least the sheath ahead of it. Uh, Janet Kazira has long argued that the uh, extreme density ahead of that event during northward IMF just filled the system. And as a result, the, the measures that we typically take for a storm being DST, uh, it, that event showed a DST of about minus 124, which is, you know, happens three times a year. 
but the impacts of that storm across the board were just wildly beyond belief, including to the point of blowing up sea mines in uh, south of Haiphong Harbor. And so there are some storms that are probably hidden out there because if we go to indices that don't tell us that the system is preconditioned uh, or just miss that fact, and we, there are probably a bunch of storms out there that we just don't know about. Long answer to a short question. Extreme storm effect called uh, overcooling or overdamping occur, which is a thermospheric uh, response to extreme energy input. Um, I think it is probably happening in any great storm. I've just started looking at the November 1960 storm, which I think was a storm that may have gotten DOD's attention to the point that they actually brought up a space environment support service that was ready to go for the 19. 67 event, and in looking at that data from, again, Hakia, it looks like the same thing occurred. So uh, it looks like this, this is a situation where a great storm also appears to be a preconditioned situation. So the, uh, the events that I looked at in, the ver in kind of my first paper on that indicated that the, when you would get those extreme events, you had density built up in advance. You were dealing with a shock-led storm or maybe a precondition situation. So we were seeing that even in moderate storms where the DST perhaps only hit minus 150 and probably seeing it in some storms where it was occurring, the DST didn't even make the mark to, to uh, have folks realize that there should have been a storm. So the Air Force had kind of called these problem storms because we didn't, we just didn't know what else to call them. They just, they make the forecast and the forecast would go bust. And so they came to me and said, well, what's going on? And I go, well, what's the issue? And they go, we don't know, you tell us. <laughs> that took three years. But uh, there are two new papers, which I've had nothing to do with, uh, that are recently out in, one's in space weather, I think, and one's in, in JGR, where they're now looking at that question. I think, I think they're starting to see the signal a lot, and we just didn't know to look for it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's happening. We just didn't know to look for it. Different aspects of the system from multiple instruments, in particular 
commercial satellites and looking at the magnetometer data that is available from Iridium and now being uh, reprocessed so that you can use it to create uh, maps of global field aligned currents. And certainly the folks at Johns, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins APL have, have developed that technique and have been doing it, but uh, different people are coming in with different approaches, kind of stabilizing the background, and, and my student has shown um, what happens when you actually provide a stable, consistent background from hundreds of days of data and then just use small chunks of data where you don't have to, you know, integrate over 20 minutes or 10 minutes and that kind of thing. And so I think the ability to um, fuse data uh, and to, uh, uh, to find ways of, you know, characterizing its uncertainties, but and maybe if it is still, you know, highly error prone, there's still signals in there and so this, um, these abilities to do data assimilation, and uh, I think the, the next up and coming thing that fascinate, fascinates me and also terrifies me because I don't understand it very well is um, what to do with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. There are signals out there that are going to be brought up, and you know what what will be our role? Uh, there are going to be some signals that probably have nothing to do with the physical system, yet they show up. And so we're going to have to have pretty smart people looking at these uh, NARCs types of systems and, and asking, you know, oh, it tells me an answer that there's you know, something going on here. Is that physical? Is that part of, you know, the system? Or is that, you know, some mathematical thing that's happening? So to me, that's, that's exciting. Uh, a little scary, too, because I'm not an expert uh, in that. So these, this data fusion and then, you know, a huge amount of data and extract the signals out of it are really, uh, really exciting to me. And I guess the other thing that, you know, the possibility of using ultimately some kind of technique, remote sensing technique, to figure out whether IMF is, the interplanetary magnetic field is coming to us is going to have a southward component or not. Uh, you know, that's still, I think, in the initial stages, but think what that could do for forecasting if you could say, yeah, it's, it's headed our way. Michael, excuse me, first of all, I don't normally talk like this. <laughs> I'm asked that question almost every time I talk about that, and the single answer that I have right now is that I have talked with um, um, Pat Spoth. What's his first name? I cannot think of. Alexa. Alexa. Yeah, Alexa. And he told me that as a graduate student, his advisor told him that event funded uh, uh, Russian radars for a full solar cycle, if not more. So I think everybody was aware of how close we were on that tripwire. I did not know about the launches of the two spacecraft, the surveillance spacecraft, until after I had published the paper. But it just, when I, when I learned of that, it's almost like the hair was standing up in the back of my neck to realize how very, very close we were, how tense the situation was, and I think people making decisions at NORAD and probably at SAC would not have known what was going on kind of in the national intelligence world except for a few, certainly not people making decisions out on the flight lines, and so we were very, very close to not being here. I will point out there's a nice connection because that ballistic missile lure the wings was prototyped half a kilometer. Is that right? The 440 megahertz system here was the prototype of the ah. beaming system. So when I saw that frequency come up, and we saw the three beaming systems, I thought, we have to look at what we were on. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was it's amazing. It's Arecibo was measuring at 440. Oh, and uh, they just saw the, uh, the ionosphere just kind of disappear. Uh, I, I don't think they could get signal back. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really, really extraordinary. So there's... There's the 67 event, the 72 event, which needs quite a bit more work. And like I said, I've 
been in the archives for the 1960 event now and just starting to see some of the things that went on there. All of those are preconditioned events with different kinds of things happening. And I think what we're going to do is probably, uh, Mike Hepgood and I, are, uh, Mike I know has already been working on some aspects of this, but developing these kinds of case studies scenario based so that you can look and say, okay, how could space weather possibly put itself together in all of these different ways so that you can come up with something that goes horribly bad? And, uh, you know, that, that the educator in me comes out and says, ah, oh, we need to do that. I'll stay up all night working on that. Won't watch, probably won't watch football. <laughs> it's, it's a, okay. th there's, a, there's a funny story that goes, that goes with that. And that's, it took me six years to write the undergraduate textbook that is now, is now used at, at, in many places. And, um, you know, I would write that on nights and weekends. And it took six years. And finally, that book was done in 2011. Yeah, I think it was 2011. It was pretty close to the time that um, the playoffs were going on, National Football League, American Football League. And I was done, so I didn't have anything else to do. I went down, I sat on the couch with my husband to watch a football game. And he and the cat looked at me and said, who are you and what are you doing on our couch? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so then when I ran out of things to do, I said, well, I can be a space weather editor. That's what I can do on Sunday afternoon during football games. I do occasionally watch the replays, though, just to keep up. Other questions? Well, let's thank Dolores again. That was a really excellent record. So, uh, as is the custom uh, with these, we would like to present you with a token of our appreciation. And this is a plaque which you can place on your wall. Presented in grateful recognition of the 20th annual lecture from the Michael White J. Bonsanto Memorial Lecture Series to Dolores Knipp. So, Thank, Thank you, you again, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to everybody who attended locally and for all of you online, and hello to John Foster who made me watch another one of his videos.